the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. There are some services of Holy Week that we're used to doing to a near-empty church, but this isn't one of them. In many parishes around the world, this is the most attended service of the whole year. In a normal year in some cities, you have to arrive early if you want to be inside the church for this lamentation service. I remember as a kid, I knew it was special somehow, and I would ask, what's this service about? Why is it so many people here? Why is it so special? And as we explained to small children in simple ways, somebody said to me, this is Jesus' funeral. What an odd thought. On, on one hand, it's actually very accurate. When we go to bury somebody, we do a couple things. We say good words about them. That's what the word eulogy means. It's good words. We say good words about the person. But at every funeral, and especially Orthodox Christian funerals, the focus is not only on the person who's died, the, per the focus is also on us. And that's what this service has been. We've said good words about Jesus in all of the readings and in all of the hymns that we sung. We said good words about the good God that is our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if we were listening at all, we also heard words that challenge us. Just like we go to a funeral and think about our own mortality, and we think about the good qualities of whoever it is that we are saying goodbye to, and how that challenges us to go on living, this service does the exact same thing for us. I don't know who's watching this. Maybe some of you haven't seen the church since last Holy Friday. And as I do every Holy Friday, because there are people who sometimes only attend this service, I want to talk to you. Because if we live the Christian life coming to one or two or three services a year and think that's normal, we're wrong. On the rolls of this parish, and by the way, I'm very proud of our parish, we have many things that I am incredibly thankful for, many blessings that sometimes I shed tears of gratitude when I think about. But in spite of all of that, on the rolls of our parish, about half of the names that we list as what we call members are people that we hardly ever see. Now, I'm not talking about people that are shut in and cannot come to church. Believe me when I tell you that some of them in their 80s handle technology better than some of us a lot younger, and they live stream and watch these services long before the rest of us were. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about others who, for whatever reason, have mistaken Orthodox Christian life to be to come to a service or two a year. If that's you, I want to challenge you. I'm not saying it has to be tonight. But someday or some night, I want you to think about making a decision. Because to imagine you can wear that cross that maybe you're wearing and hold on to that title of Orthodox Christian in whatever you think it means, but don't participate in the community of the others is not what it means to be an Orthodox Christian. Your faith, whatever it is, and I don't judge your faith, but I can tell you that I don't understand it. I don't understand an Orthodox faith that can come on Holy Friday and not crave to be here on Holy Saturday or Pascha, or Thomas Sunday, or other services that we have, and not just services, but part of the community. 
And my challenge to you is this. It doesn't have to be tonight. But at some day or some night, maybe it's time to say that this isn't for you. Maybe you would be better off saying, if this is what Christian life means, then maybe I don't want it. Maybe it's time to say, you don't believe in God. That's not what I want. It's obviously not what I want. But what I don't want more than that is for people to assume we can define our relationship with God on our terms. Because every one of us is going to meet God on his terms. So maybe, if that's you, maybe you decide to imagine your life without God. When I talk to the kids at camp and they start to express doubts about their faith, I challenge them and I say, which would be easier for you to say? I do believe in God, or I don't believe in God. And in their doubts, they probably thought it would be easier to say that they don't believe in God. And when I challenge them, I've never had somebody say that that would be easier. They come to realize how hard it is to say, I don't believe in God. And I hope you won't get there. But better to get there than imagine that a life with God is on your terms. So I want to challenge you to rethink your commitment to this God. For those of you that are longing to be here tonight, and we are, let me tell you, longing to have you here, maybe more than you're longing to be here. The challenge is for you and the challenge is for us who are here. We are no less challenged in our faith whether we are the five of us here tonight or the many watching that would have been here tonight because they're here for many services. The challenge to us is no less drastic than to somebody who comes once or twice a year. You could probably remember what your life was like more or less last Holy Friday. And the question to us is, what did we do with this year? Did we change substantially? Have we grown in our faith? Have we taken the steps that God has given us to take to draw close to him? Or not? Our Lord defines how every one of us meets him. And in the church, it's very clear. We join the church in baptism because baptism is death. At no other time and on no other day throughout the entire church year do we understand what it means to be a Christian more than today. Since last night we've heard the same readings over and over again from every, four, every one of the four Gospels telling in, dis in detail the sufferings and the death of Jesus Christ. And we mourn that. That's the part of this that really is Jesus' funeral. But we don't mourn Jesus like we mourn someone else because we know he's already risen. We'll commemorate every step in that process throughout this week, and we haven't gotten there yet, but we don't pretend he's not alive. We know he is. We've already even sung hymns of the resurrection in this service. His funeral service, we proclaim his resurrection. But to follow Christ is to understand what he did, and we do that today as we focus on his suffering and his death. And God willing, we'll continue and celebrate the life that he brings us. And as he emerges from the empty tomb, he turns around and he says to every one of us, follow me. And the way to follow him, he was very, very clear. We've heard it throughout this Lenten season. We hear it throughout the whole church year. Deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Not us, 
not follow a lifestyle we want to live by, not live by standards we want to live by, deny ourselves, take up our cross as he took up his, and follow him. At the same time, it's an immense task. The greatest challenge we could be given. And yet, as we've prayed over and over tonight in every service, our God is good and merciful and loving. And as he sees us looking at our cross, wondering if we have the strength to pick it up, he leans down with us and he joins us in picking up that cross. Yes, he calls us to follow him, but not without him. So to everyone, those that are here, given this wonderful blessing to be in the church tonight, and those of you that aren't given that blessing, let's think about the next time we're gonna come back to church. For the five of us, God willing, in the morning. For the rest of you, we don't know. What I do know is this, for every single one of us, if we don't come back to the church the next time, not having just changed a little, but having remembered that we died to ourselves so that we could live with God. If we don't do that, then for every one of us and to myself, we better not come back. How long will we, as the prophet says in the Old Testament, trample God's courts with our noisy feet, making noise in his holy house? My brothers and sisters, if we can't understand the immensity of God's love tonight, when are we going to? And if we can't understand that love and change because of it, when are we going to? So let's all decide. Just as we leave the funeral of another loved one and say, I want to continue that legacy. Let's let new life, the new life that dawns from this empty tomb, let's let that be our legacy now. Let's join it. Let's stop playing around. Let's stop pretending. Let's stop taking it easy. Let's take God seriously. He's a serious God. Yes, he's a loving God, but he's an honest God. And he's so honest that he says to us, if you don't want to follow me, I will not make you. Of all the religions of the world, our God makes himself so small allows himself to be beaten and killed and laid in a tomb. How powerless can our God be? Why? To give us the room and the power. To say, I let you make your choice. And he doesn't make it for us. But he invites us. He invites us lovingly, softly, caringly, but that road he invites us to is a death to new life. That's the road. On this day that we commemorate our Lord's death and begin to celebrate his triumph over death by his death, let's remember that we too died. If you're a Christian, you were baptized. If you're an Orthodox Christian, baptized as one, you went under the water and your mother understood that symbolism of death. So let's understand it for ourselves and live like that. Let's live as if we were baptized, as if we have already died, as we heard in the readings tonight. So that when Christ rises, we can rise with him. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.